Hello and welcome to Under the Lens series is back once again to break down another quarterback with Derek Clawson at QB class. Today we're going to be looking at Gunnar Keel. Derek's a fan of Gunnar Keel. I'm a fan of Gunnar Keel just because of his first name, Gunnar. I'm going to say it a lot today. So Derek, just starting with you, how are you doing today? <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. This is my last weekend uh, as a high school student, so um, that's kind of a trip, but I'm excited to do this show. Well, congratulations, my friend. Thank you. And also joining us today will be my dog Lola, giving her thoughts on everything that goes on with, yeah, so she'll be joining us today as well. It's going to be an exciting time. It's going to be an exciting time. So let's talk about Gunnar Keel. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of big names in this class. I mean, Hackenberg, we watched, and everyone can go back and check that out. It's on YouTube, and we'll be linking it out later. I mean, but there's also some big names, the Ohio State quarterback trio and everyone. But, you know, Gunnar Keel's not a name that's mentioned a lot. What did what stood out to you about Gunnar Keel? Um, Gunnar Keel is a really – he was a very smart player. I thought um, a lot of his footwork looked really good. Uh, he wasn't afraid to take any shots, which is something I like to value a lot. Um, his arm isn't spectacular, but I think he has plenty of arm to – um, you know, throw the sideline and, and throw deep well enough uh, in the NFL. Um, I mean, he's really, really accurate. His anticipation is pretty good. Um, and you, kind of like you were saying, there's a lot of these other big names in the class, like you, all the Ohio State guys, uh, Connor Cook, even Cody Kessler and, like, Trevon Boykin are all seem to get more attention than uh, than Gunnar Keel does, which it, it just doesn't make sense to me because – Gunner Keel is a lot of what um, you know NFL teams value, and I think a lot of people are just weary right now because of all the um, you know how he decommitted from like two different schools or something, and then ended up transferring from Notre Dame once he finally landed there. So I think people are just a little bit weary about that aspect of him. But I mean, he played incredible for a first year starter, and I think he's really only going to get better. Yeah, I mean his road. To uh, Cincinnati is an interesting one. I mean, decommitted from Indiana, decommitted from a number of schools, and then went to Notre Dame. Didn't like it there, just wasn't seeing the playing time he wanted, so he transferred again. Well, transferred to Cincinnati. Bearcats really have been in a home for him in this season. He put up some damn impressive numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I heard, um, you know, some people kind of calling him like this reckless gunslinger. And, like, I don't really see that. I don't think he's necessarily, like, super safe with the ball, like maybe a, uh, Jared Goff or something. But I think Keel has that, you know, that blend of aggressiveness but also, um, you know, intelligence with the ball to to uh, make more good plays than he's going to make bad plays. I don't, I don't really think he's, you know, a bad gunslinger at all. Yeah, but I'd like my quarterback to have some kahunas who's able to take chances and not just be passive. Andy Dalton. <laughs> exactly. I, I really don't like when quarterbacks aren't willing to to make um, you know the throws they need to make because there's going to be times where you absolutely have to make those throws, and if you one aren't willing to make the throw and two aren't physically capable of making the throw, then you're going to have a lot of problems winning big games. So, is looking at Gunnar Keel, I mean, six foot four, over two hundred twenty pounds, size wise, is everything you want. Um, be a franchise quarterback coming out of high school was one of the top quarterbacks in the country uh, five-star recruit on rivals.com so pretty highly touted guy obviously we talked about some of the issues where decommitting from school and stuff but, you know that's just the player finding where his right home is and right fit mm -hmm. and he found it at Cincinnati yeah he did and their offense is kind of like a it's kind of like an air raid um, which so like I mean this is actually a perfect comparison. I, I didn't really have a comparison for him until I started talking to Justice about him a little bit, and he was like, Gunnar Keel is Drew Brees. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and even the offense that uh, Keel runs at Cincinnati is um, pretty similar. You know, it, It's kind of like a college equivalent to what New Orleans um, does in the NFL. So I think you know, comparing him to Gunnar Keel, it, it makes a lot of – Gunnar Keel and Drew Brees, it makes a lot of sense, and I think – that's probably um, Keel's ceiling. 
Well, you know, people are going to complain about that because they're different heights, so naturally people just can't make the connection. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Keel's like four inches taller. There's no way they're the same player. Never. No <laughs> no chance at it. All right, so let's take a look at Gunner Kill. I mean, you talk about the offense, and naturally people will have issue with it not being a pro-style offense, but if it was a pro-style offense, people would still have issue with it. So I'm just going to enjoy the offense today as he takes on Ohio State. Mm -hmm. I mean, it definitely is kind of an air raid, and they do some um, – like their running game is like three plays, and that's it. And then um, their offense is a lot of um, spread, cough, spread concepts with their receivers. But you still see Keel making a lot more um, post-snap reads than you would see from, you know, a normal quote-unquote spread offense or air raid offense. Um, and, and that's something I like to see, even even when the offense shouldn't be allowing to, him to be doing those things. Uh, there's still instances where you see him make um, a lot of reads on one play. All right, so let's take a look at Gunnar Keel versus Ohio State this past season. And it actually is a pretty short cut up, only about four minutes, so it shouldn't take that long. We'll get it set up as usual on half speed uh, to the commentators who are commentating on this game. I'm sorry we don't get to listen to your commentating, but, you know, just not your time. All right, so here we go, setting it up. I mean, you can – on that play, it almost looks like he has that really low base like Drew Brees likes to play out of. Like, a, Justice probably – Justice had this pretty spot on. That's a really impressive throw to be able to make because, like, if you don't put enough on that, that uh, that defender's jumping that route, but he puts just enough on it to to get it outside and get it over the defender, but not too much to where he's overthrowing his receiver and making that an incomplete pass. And there, there's really like that's such an underappreciated throw because there's actually there's really not a lot of guys that are going to be able to make that throw. Um. Keel's deep ball is kind of weird. Like, it's not awful, but it's kind of like Tannehill's in the sense that he's not going to throw it. Um, you know, he's not throwing it. He's, it's, he's not going to need a deep ball receiver that's going to get up and say, oh, he's going to need a deep ball receiver that he's like, I'm going to throw it kind of in the general area to where you can make a play on it, and you're going to have to fight for it. And, um, I, I mean, at least Keel's getting it in the general area a lot of times, but he definitely – could stand to put a little more on it and get um, get the push the ball farther down the field and make it a little more easy on his uh, on his receiver. That's an impressive throw. Splits the three defenders with about a ten yard route with you know pressure all up in his face. Doesn't isn't able to throw from the base that he wants to, but he still completes the throw. See, on that deep ball, he should have put it uh, – he could have put that farther to the left and gave his guy at least separation from the cornerback. I mean, it doesn't – can you rewind that play a little bit? To the start, I just want to see if like he had a better route to throw to on the other side, or no, it doesn't look like it. It looks like they're just gonna try to give someone yards after the catch. So it looks like he made the right decision in, um, in throwing that slant, and he threw it well enough to where his receiver could stand stride. Uh, so considering though there really wasn't a route that was gonna cross. Um, across the sticks at any point, that was about as best as he could do there. Is that the fumble one? Yeah. Yeah. Fumble well, kicked out of the end zone safety. Yeah, I remember that one. That one looks like it. Uh, it was just really fast, uh, free pressure. So there really probably wasn't much he could do about that. Here, he's actually a pretty decent athlete. I mean, he's not like. He's not necessarily super jumpy and quick, like like a you know RG three or something. Um, but you know, in a straight line, he's going to be able to pick up yards like that and, and get down the field. I mean, there he gets like twenty yards almost. And um, would you call it Aaron Rodgers' athleticism? Um, 
I mean, athletically, that's that's actually a pretty good comp, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's not like it's not sneaky athleticism because that that's a stupid term. He's he's actually pretty he's decently athletic, and he see he does it again. And I remember the other game I watched for him was the East Carolina game, and I remember there were a couple in that game too, even where whether it be read option or him scrambling, he was able to pick up um, quite a few yards just because he's able to pick up ground pretty easily. Now, that if we were broadcasting, now yeah. if we were broadcasting, we'd have to call it sneaky athleticism because it's a white quarterback. Exactly. I would be obligated to do so. Um, the, uh, the, cur the deep curl he threw to the left side of the sideline right there, um, just a few plays back, that he should have hit that throw. He had the timing right and everything. He just threw it too high and outside because it looked like he was saw the cornerback or the defender was uh, playing to the inside. So I think he wanted to make sure he was throwing that outside and just uh, put a little bit too much on it. Again, that looks like a really simple throw, and I said this when we were watching Hackenberg, but like, for a guy to know that it's a kind of a f relatively far throw for how close that defender's supposed to be, um, you know, to be able to hit that on time and everything is is more impressive than it looks. That was a good deep ball. It looked like he was pretty open, though. To be fair, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, still, he at least he got it there and got it in stride for. He's got to make a play on it and score. Andy Dalton doesn't make that throw. Andy Dalton sucks. Like he's, I was actually watching him for my Nate and I's quarterback passing charts just a few days ago, and like Andy Dalton is just, he's not good. And I'll be able to say that more when we talk about uh, when we do this under the lens with Connor Cook, because I think Connor Cook is basically Andy Dalton. Oh, that that has me all types of excited. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Can you rewind this throw? It looks like, um, if I remember correctly, when I watched this the first time just on my own, he holds a defender. Yeah, it looks like he baits. I think that might have been Bosa for some reason. No. I, I don't know. Whoever that um, the shallow defender is, it looks like he kind of baits him to the sideline on the swing and then hits his guy over on the, the kind of slant route and lets his guy take it all the way to the house. I mean, for Cincinnati, like for Keel to have taken Cincinnati and made this game like competitive, that was pretty impressive uh, because uh, nobody could compete with Ohio State. I mean, they won the national championship. So for someone like Cincinnati to be able to compete was pretty impressive. Well, it's not as if Cincinnati's defense was having a stellar game. It was an offensive game, and he was able to get yeah. that. Exactly. Uh, this throw it looks like he could have thrown either slant route, um, but he completed it either way. So it, uh, like, it, there's really nothing you can say. Like you see, it looks like he kind of has the guy there, um, but then again, he hits this one anyway. So um, that play, he could have gone either way. It looked like he might have gotten a little more yards after the catch with the guy over the middle, but um, I mean, he, he still got the first down. I really can't complain. That was a that was a pretty good deep ball. I mean, he obviously could have put maybe two yards of uh, air under it and, you know, a little bit more to the right. So this guy didn't have to go find it and die for it. He could have just kept uh, sprinting and maybe pulled that touchdown off. I mean, he's only 20 yards away. Um, oh, that wasn't even complete. That's right. I remember that. I mean, he, it, it was a catchable ball, but it still wasn't. A great throw. Yeah, you'd like it to be a little bit deeper, as you said. Just exactly. let your wide receiver try and create something. That throw was about as close as that 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 post, that corner post was about as close as that throw can get. Um, it's just the receiver couldn't come down with it. I mean, on the other hand, it's like the coverage was so good, and that's going to be such a hard throw to complete. But I think there was still a decent chance that the receiver could have got a foot in bounds and he just didn't. Um, I think he'll made a good play there. 
And then this was just third and 26. They don't want to risk anything, so they're just going to dump it off, which I understand um, to some degree. But against Ohio State, I think if you really want to compete, you have to throw it down the field. Well, Ohio State showed in this game that they were having some issues with the deep plays. Mm -hmm. See, Keel's doing a very good job of those, you know, short timing routes, making sure he's um, making that throw as soon as his guy turns around so that the defender really doesn't have a chance on it. That was a bad throw. That could have been completed and had some yards after the catch. He just threw it too far behind his guy. Which really is a rare thing from Keel. I mean, for the most most part, he's a really accurate quarterback. Um, that one looked like it was a bit overthrown. Uh, can you rewind this play a little bit? Because I want to see if there was a route that, like a, a more open route that crossed the sticks. I mean, honestly, he completes his throw, but with the game the way it is, if he wants to win, I would have liked to have seen him throw the guy that's running up the sideline there. Yeah. Um, even if he's, you know, not going to complete it, at least throw it to where you know the defender can't get it and then maybe your receiver has a shot on it. I would have liked to have seen that, but generally I don't see hesitancy from Keel, and, I mean, he still completed a throw, so... I'm not going to harp on him too bad for it, um, but I definitely would have liked this to have seen that instead. Um, that's, that's it. I said, mean, as we mentioned, it's a, it's a short game. Yeah, it's a short, but, um, but I've, I've seen that one of him, and I've seen his um, the East Carolina game. And his East Carolina game, uh, game, the stat line was actually worse because he threw two interceptions, I believe. It might have even been three. Uh, but one was just a tip ball. Um, oh, no, it was three. I remember all of them. One was a tip ball. really wasn't his fault. The other one was um, it was like a dig, and his receiver didn't run through the route like he should have. And, um, like, you know, he got scared, heard footsteps, all that. And he didn't run through the route, didn't really fight for the ball. Defender was able to jump it um, and fight for that. That was picked off. So I guess to some degree that was his fault for trying to force the throw. But then again, if you have a receiver fight for that, at the least that's only an incompletion, and he probably could have caught that pass. And then the other one uh, the other one was his fault. It was kind of ugly. He was throwing from the left hash to the right sideline, and he had a little bit of pressure in his face. It was like a 12-yard comeback, and he had pressure in his face, didn't feel like throwing it away. And um, he kind of jumped off of his back foot and tried to make the throw, and he just put too much air under it. Defender was able to jump it. Um, so there I would like to see Keel just you know, throw the ball away because there's really no need to try to make that kind of throw, um, especially you know, going from the left hash to the right sideline with pressure in your face. There's really almost no one that's going to be able to make that throw cleanly, uh, so there's really no... You shouldn't be risking that. And I think may, that's maybe something that is going to come with experience with him, you know, just getting snaps under his belt. Like, he's going to understand when to just, you know, get rid of the ball as opposed to trying to do something like that. Um, I'm not going to bank on that. Um, you know, I'm not going to bank on him getting a lot better in that area. But I don't think we need to with Keel. I think Keel's already a very, very talented quarterback. Um, for now, he's my quarterback, too. And unless Goff somehow fixes his pea shooter arm or um, Josh Dobbs, well, I mean, I like Josh Dobbs a lot, but he's only, I think he's only like a true junior and he still um, has some work to do. I mean, even his arm isn't all that great. Um, it's maybe a hair above Goff's. Um, but I do like Dobbs. I, I don't think he was going to be better than Keel, though. Dobbs should be a fun one next week, though, because I think, you know, with everyone that likes Goff, there's, like, you. I was watching Dobbs, and I was like, what does Goff do better than Josh Dobbs does? And honestly, Dobbs has better pocket presence. You know, he's a more natural, um, 
he's you know he handles rushers better um, and he's more athletic and even though I don't think his arm is great I would say it's a tad better than Goff's and uh, Dobbs isn't afraid to you know make the throws you see with Goff you know if it's like a you know five yard out and there's a defender kind of there he'll just look away he doesn't want to make that throw he doesn't want to risk it because I don't think he I think he knows his arm's not gonna be able to make that throw so he just looks away um, and you know some people might say that's a smart thing to do but on the other hand if you're not physically capable of making these throws and you're, you're too scared to make these throws that's more concerning than him being smart to me um, but you know Dobbs it, it, he has enough arm to make those throws and um, he's confident that he can make those throws so he takes those shots and he completes them and that, that's why I like Dobbs a lot so he should be fun next week uh, but going back to Keel there's a lot I really like about him I mean above average arm you saw he's a decent athlete on a couple of those runs he has the size um, he's generally accurate I mean I only counted maybe four or five kind of off passes in that game um, he's a smart player you saw him hold a couple of defenders and stuff like that um, I just think there's a lot to like with Keel you saw his timing on his footwork with you know those hitches and curls um, with two of those deep curls it looked like he could have um, settled down a little bit and not tried to throw it so far outside to avoid the defender I think if he just sticks his guy in the numbers he probably completes that throw um, so and then that might just be you know him thinking too much about the play and thinking I have to do something special to make this play work when he really doesn't. And, you know, again, that's maybe something I think he can fix with experience. Um, and, you know, for him to show everything that he did as a first-year starter, it's just really, really impressive. So I'm excited to see him next year. I don't know if he'll improve, um, but I, I could see him improving in a couple of areas just based off getting some more snaps. And I think it's going to be hard for me to dethrone him from QB2. Oh, you know, that's the thing. I mean, well, the, with this series, obviously, uh, during the year, we're going to go back and find one of the 2015 games and play it so we can see if he made improvements, what improvements he made. And just the one thing, I mean, he's bounced around a lot. I mean, he went to Notre Dame, didn't work out there. Cincinnati was his first year starting. So with another year, there really should be improvement, their mastery of that offense, making things happen, smarter decisions, and just good, better throws. Just, I mean, th there should be improvement next year. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I'm kind of done, like, assuming there's going to be improvement, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll recognize areas where there could very likely be improvement. Uh, like with Q, I think, you know, there's going to be some just getting live reps. I think it's going to help him. Um, and even as much as I hate, well, I don't, I don't hate Jared Goff. I think he's a smart player, but as much as I seem to not like him as others, um, I think if he adds on weight, you know, that is going to be able to fit his frame. I don't know, his frame's weird, so I'm not sure how much weight he's going to be able to put on comfortably. Um, but if he can put on weight and if his shoulder can kind of fully heal from the surgery he had, um, I think early, I think it was um, before this year started, um, you know, this past season, I think if all of that can kind of come together, his arm is going to look good enough to where he's not going to have these issues. Um, you know, with his arm and being hesitant. So, you know, I think with every player, there's areas you can recognize, oh, they could get better here, but I'm not going to assume it. I'm, I'm going to take these, these players for what. Yeah, but you know, that's, yeah. Pretty comfortably QB2. Yeah, and that's what, the, with the improvement thing, I mean, because you know, it doesn't, doesn't always happen. That's, I think that's been proven. But mm -hmm. I mean, we've talked about in the past, uh, Josh Dobbs. Who I'm next Wednesday. I'm so so excited to watch. I'm just mm -hmm. can't wait. But I mean, freshman year, I I didn't see anything that said NFL quarterback. It no, that just yeah, aeronautics degree. That. You could have gone. He could have gone for it. No NFL. With that jump as a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Woo. The only thing I have with like major jumps like that is like once you make your major jump, there's not going to be too much you're going to improve after that. And I think golf was kind of the same way. Like as a freshman, he really wasn't that good. And then he made this huge jump sophomore year, became a lot smarter, was making more accurate throws, all that kind of stuff. And he made this huge jump and, you know, he was more comfortable in the pocket. He made this huge jump. And I think, you know, him and Dobbs can still 
improve, but I think once you make your major jump, there's not too much you're going to be able to do after that. And that's okay because they're both they're both good quarterbacks right now. And Goff really isn't even uh, how he is as a player. It's just how he is as a as a physical being. And I think he can improve there. And Dobbs, I think I honestly do think Dobbs is better than uh, Jared Goff already. I think he's as smart as Jared Goff is, and I think he's more willing to make the throws, and I think he's more comfortable in the pocket. Um, I was talking about him with uh, a couple of the guys like Ben Natan and and Charles, who we're going to have on for the Dobbs show, I think. Um, we were talking about Dobbs, and I basically said, I was like, Dobbs is kind of like Manziel if Manziel knew how to be a presence in the pocket as a passer. You know, he really, like, if, if Manziel really knew how to stand in the pocket and command the game from the pocket, and then Ben was like, that's Tony Romo. I was like, man, that comp really makes a lot of sense. Dobbs really is a lot like Tony Romo. And... You know, some people might be watching and be like, well, Romo sucks. Well, no, Romo's top 10 quarterback. And, and I think Dobbs can kind of be, you know, that style of player and be that good. Man, I mean. It makes a lot of sense. Like, it didn't, it didn't, I didn't know who to compare him to. And then Ben hasn't even seen him. But once I said that Manziel thing, he was like, that's basically Tony Romo. I was like, yeah, it, it kind of is. <laughs> it's like a light bulb just going, wow. Yeah, exactly. I was the same way. <laughs> huh. It's going to be, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say, you know, Dobbs is going to be as good as Tony Romo because Romo's top 10 quarterback. But I think, I think as a ceiling, I could see Dobbs being Romo or at least close to what Romo is. Wait, does this mean you're making a cross? Comparison, you're not comparing Dobbs at NFL.com to other quarterbacks? Other black no, quarterbacks, I, is that what you're doing? Not doing it. Not doing it. We're doing the, the cross-racial comparisons. Oh, no. This is, I mean, we're calling – oh, man. I'm sorry, broadcasting people watching this. We're, we're disappointing you, I know. We're not calling people sneaky athletes. We're making cross-racial comparisons. I don't know what we're doing on here. Oh, man. We need a Wes Welker here to just – Compare every <laughs> white wide receiver to just balance things out. All right, so overall, you mentioned Gunnar Keel, your QB two. I mean, um, there mm. should, there could be some improvement. It's not a guarantee, obviously. Uh, it's early, but you said he's your number two quarterback right now. I mean, it's again, it's early. Twenty sixteen NFL draft. Where would you feel comfortable taking him? Man, I mean, it is early, but. If we're going to sit here and assume that he doesn't improve, he's a first-round pick. And, I mean, with the way quarterbacks are valued, um, God, this sounds like so premature, but, I mean, with how good I think he is and the way quarterbacks are valued, I could see him going top five just because he's a smart player. He's going to be productive. Um, you know, he, he's. it looks like his teams are going to be successful under him. Um, he came out his first year and just had a great year. Um, you know, he has all the physical tools that you're looking for. He commands the pocket pretty well. Um, you saw uh, there were a couple of instances where he threw from a compromised base pretty well and made a throw. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff that he does that's really, really impressive and you know, it's things, you know, it's traits that you look at all the top NFL quarterbacks and you see, you know, some degree of that trait in there to make them successful. And I think Keel has all of those traits and I think he can be really good. So maybe it is a little early to call someone like him a top five or 10 pick, but I, I think that's, you know, when it's all said and done, that's going to be where he's at. And you, you can vault me on that one. That's, I'm pretty comfortable with saying he's that good. <laughs> well, to be fair, people are calling Connor Cook a top five pick, which is. Um... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> calling Connor Cook the top five pick is calling Andy Dalton the top five pick. I, and some people, I'm excited to do the, the Cook show because some people are like, well, I think Cook, Connor Cook is like Matt Ryan. It's like, man, slow your roll because Matt Ryan is like a brilliant quarterback. He's one of the smartest quarterbacks in the league. And Cook isn't dumb, but he's, I mean, he's kind of just average in that regard. Which is kind of like why I compare him to Andy Dalton because like Andy Dalton's not necessarily stupid, but he's not gonna make 
these incredible post snap plays. Um, and physically, he's a lot like Andy Dalton. Just the way he moves, he's a lot like Andy Dalton. The Andy Dalton name is going to come up a lot when we watch Connor Cook. Dear NFL teams, I just ask, if you're going to draft Connor Cook, please keep great wide receivers away from him. Don't pull them down just because you wanted Connor Cook. That's all I ask. Exactly. All right, so next week, basically. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, that's basically what Andy Dalton is doing with A.J. Green. It's, it's, it's sad and heartbreaking. Man. It's, it's it unfortunate. One day I'm going to create a Sarah McLaughlin ad. And look at those commercials where <laughs> there's going to be AJ Green. She's singing about Andy Dalton holding him down and <laughs> ruining him. It will come one day. Yeah. So, yeah, next week, I mean, I don't have anything, so I'm going to see how many videos we can do. Wednesday, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, the Josh Dobbs mm -hmm. breakdown. I mean, I may order a Josh Dobbs jersey before anything happens so I can just have it on. <laughs> Although, granted, owning a Josh Jobs jersey would mean NCAA gets money and he doesn't. So, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. That's true. All right. Uh, Derek, again, at QB Class, thank you so much. I mean, this series, like we mentioned with Keel, starting now, we saw 2014 Ohio State. For 2015, we're going to watch a game in the coming future. I'm excited, mm -hmm. man. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited for Enough to see Keel again and just to see um you know the rest of these preseason guys this is gonna be a really fun series. Absolutely.